Good afternoon and welcome to Moments of Hope with yours, Pastor, yours truly, Pastor Curtis Grant. And to all of you that have joined us, God bless you. I'm so grateful to God just for the privilege of just sharing with you this book called The Bible. For those of you that are going to join with us, the conference call, you can dial 515-606-5380. And then the access code is 636090. And as we approach our particular lesson for today, uh, we see that we are in chapter 3, and uh, I'm going to read chapter 3 and verse 7 and a few of the following verses, and uh, hopefully we can get some kind of revelation out of it to help us to understand life and the things that are relevant to us. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. For I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land of, unto a good land and a large, and unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the uh, Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the, Par the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the city of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptian oppressed them. Now come therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. <clears throat> And that's where we will conclude our reading. And uh, I, I think it is important that we understand that uh, Exodus is the book of departure. It is the book that's found in the Pentateuch of Moses, the five books of Moses. And the book of Exodus gives us an insight of how God brings Israel out of Egypt. You see chapter 1, you see chapter 1 talks about the condition of Israel and how they were afflicted by their taskmasters. Chapter 2 talks about Moses and how Moses was born in uh, a, a hasty environment because Pharaoh had put a decree out to kill all the baby boys. And, uh, and Joseph Bell, who was the mother of Moses, would not kill her child or let anyone else kill her child. So she put Moses in a basket and put it on the river Nile where the Pharaoh's daughter found him and drew him out of the water. And when you get to chapter 3, you find Moses is about 40 years old. And he is now married to a woman by the name of Zephyrah, who is the daughter of Jephro in the city of Midian or the country of Midian and what you see now is that Moses is now keeping the flock of Jephro and he literally leads the flock on the backside of the mountain because there is something in the heart of Moses that wants to see God because he wants to know from God how is it that you know that your children are suffering and you've done very little about it. And so now Moses gets the chance to come into the presence of the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 2 of chapter 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. The Bible then wants to tell us that when uh, the angel, or which is we know is God or uh, in the flesh, Jesus, uh, now calls to Moses. Moses, the Bible says, hides his face uh, in the ground. And so uh, the Bible does not say in the ground, but when, to, when you hide your faith and you fall prostrate, uh, the quickest way and the best way to hide your face is to literally put your hand and put your face to the ground. 
And so when he finally finds himself prostrated before God, uh, the Lord begins to talk with Moses. And that's where we pick up in verse 7 of chapter 3, because the Bible says, And the Lord said, unto, uh, said I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And I have heard the cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I want to pause here for the moment to tell every child of God that don't ever allow Satan to convince you that you are in this by yourself. First of all, God promised that he'll never leave nor forsake us. God is with us even when we don't feel his presence near us. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that God has promised never to leave nor forsake. Now, I pause there because I want you to understand what it means to forsake. Because to leave, I think you understand, God said, I'll never depart. But he also said, I'll never forsake you. And that simply means that even even when you get in an ugly position, I'm not going to leave you because of the ugly position that you're in. And the reason that he does that is because he wants you to know that even when you're in an ugly situation, that he is not going to forsake you and leave you where he found you. And so you've got to see it here is that God is concerned about Israel's affliction. And if God is concerned about Israel's affliction, I can surely say that God is concerned about your personal afflictions. Because I want to submit that when you have been afflicted, that affliction sometimes interrupt ministry. And so God is concerned about your hurts and your pains and your afflictions. But yet not only does he know or seen them, but he also hears your cry. Mm, God, I feel like preaching anyhow. He hears your cry. And uh, sometimes you want to know why. Well, if you see me, God, and you hear me, why are you not responding? And so I want to take a look at the scripture because I need you to know that Israel, in their affliction, I'm pretty sure cried out to God. And I know that the Bible says he's seen their affliction and he's heard their cry, but he has done absolutely nothing until chapter 3 of Exodus. And so you've got to understand that when you look at God, you've got to understand why he does what he does sometimes. And I want to submit then that when we deal with afflictions, you've got to see that there's a reason that God has allowed the affliction to be applied. Uh -huh. you, you got to see. Because when you go back to chapter 1, what you'll see is, is that the more they afflicted them, the more they grew or multiplied and grew. And so, brothers and sisters, might I suggest to you the reason that God did not remove the affliction or did not move on Israel's behalf is because God understood that it was their very affliction that was causing them to multiply and to grow. Well, why is that important? Well, first of all, you got to understand that if you're going to a land that is huge and flowing with milk and honey, you can't take that kind of land and that kind of possession being small in number. And so God, in the midst of their affliction, allows the affliction to continue because what God needs to bring out of Egypt is he needs to bring a huge nation 
out of Israel so that he can take them out of bondage into a land flowing with milk and honey. And could God be allowing you to suffer in your affliction so that he could grow you? so that he can multiply you. And I'm not necessarily talking about physicality, but I'm talking about spirituality because sometimes it's in our afflictions that we seek the Lord our God. It is in our afflictions that we fall on our face and let God know what's deeply in our hearts. It is in our affliction where we pick up the Bible to try to find out what God is going to do next. And saints, let me pause here because you need to understand why the afflictions are being applied. Because first of all, anytime you live in a nation that is not your own, you're going to be afflicted. The Hebrews are in the Egyptians' culture. And any time you come in as a people, Hebrew, in a Egyptian culture, they're going to do everything they can to keep you at bay because their fear is the Egyptians, that you would grow to the place and grow so much so that you'll end up taking over their land. And don't sound like something you already know, because when you look at us as a people, uh, as coming to America, they have to keep us at bay, because they know that we grow, and we're growing because of our afflictions. And saints, I want to submit that the black people's culture is close to the Hebrew people culture. And saints, I want to show you that there is some kind of a pattern in this affliction. And so you got to understand that they were afflicted because they were different. And you got to learn how to embrace your difference. You can't be upset just because you don't look like the next person. Because God, everything he made was beautiful and wonderful. The second reason that they were being afflicted was because they were more in number. Yeah, they was afraid because they were bigger than they were. The third reason they were big, uh, being afflicted is because they were mightier. Uh, that's in Exodus 1 and 9. Mightier in power. And so anytime you are that kind of uh, big in numbers and mighty in power, you become a threat to the people who you live amongst. And y'all, I know why they're killing black people all over the world. Because when you look at us, no matter how much you've done to us, we have still survived and we're still multiplying. We're almost like baby's children. We don't die. We just multiply. And so at the end of the day, you got to understand who you are, where you are, and where God wants to take you. And you can't allow yourself to get bitter because of the affliction of your situation. You got to keep looking to the hills from which cometh your help and realize that all of your help will come from God. And so then, the Bible wants to submit that as God is talking to Moses, he says to Moses, I've seen their affliction, I've heard their cry, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptian. Notice that God does not send an angel. Notice that God does not send Gabriel. Or does he send Michael? God says, no, I got to attend to this myself because these are my people. And because they are my people, then I don't want to send nobody because I need it to be done a certain way and a certain how. And so God comes down himself, but yet when he comes down, he needs to use an instrument to do it. And Moses just happened to be the burning bush that God uses to go and free his people. Oh my, and so I want you to see it then, because when you start looking at what God is doing in this chapter,
chapter, he's prepping Moses so that he could go and deliver Israel. Now, I want to say this, and then I'm, I'm going to bounce, and I'm done. God says, I will come down and deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. But what I found interesting in this is that when God talks about delivering them, he says that I'm going to bring them up and out of the land. Oh my. In verse 8, it says, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of uh, that land unto a good land and a large. And my question to you is this. Uh, why couldn't God just bring them out? Because I want to submit that Moses put these two words together because there is some significant to these two words. God didn't bring them out first. He brought them up because up wants to imply they were down. Because when you look at the affliction that they had been enduring for 400 years, over 400 years. They had lost their self-confidence. They had lost their self-confidence in the God they said they worship because they want to know why God would leave us in a condition like this so long. And saints, I know that sometimes when you pray and God don't answer immediately, you start to question whether God hear you or whether God even cares about you. But baby, I come to remind you, God always hears your prayer. He may not answer it like you want to answer it, but he always hears it. He knows where you are. He knows the suffering. And when your season comes, he's going to bring you up and then he'll bring you out. Because the first thing you see is that God does not just bring Israel out. He bring them up. Well, how does he bring them up, Rev? Well, these miracles that he does. He, you know, uh, the Bible talks about uh, he hardened the heart of Pharaoh but saints, I want you to understand that God could have got rid of Pharaoh a long time ago and just brought him out. But God went through a process because the process was put in place to bring Israel up before he brought them out. Because how many know it's hard to deal with a people who got no faith at all. And so God uses the miracles to show Israel that every God you've trusted down through the years with your pagan worship, they have no power to deal with me, Jehovah, because I got all power. And what you have done is you have shaved and have, you know, traded, you know, gods you can make with hands to a god uh -huh, uh, uh, for a god you have not seen. In other words, y'all, you have started listening to folks that's around you with idol worship and you have traded the god, the invisible god, for a god you can see. And what God did was he challenged every god in Egypt and dared them to override his will. And that's how God brought them up. Because every time God attacked one of the gods of Egypt, the gods of Egypt could do absolutely nothing. And that's what brings and builds the confidence of Israel in the God they never seen. And so you got to understand that before God brings you out, he's got to bring you up. And you got to start listening at the miracles that God is performing in your life. Because even though you have been low in emotion, low in confidence, God got some miracles that he'll point out to you to show you that even though you lost faith in me, I never lost faith in you. And I'm going to bring you up. I'm going to hold your head up. I'm going to lift you up. Lift up 
your confidence uh, to let you know uh, that all things are possible uh, with me, God. Uh, because when you have that kind of mindset, uh, then it's time to come out uh, and go to the land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, I don't have time to deal with the land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, and so the next time we talk, uh, we'll talk about the land that God wants Israel to have. Because God always has a better plan than we do. And so if you've heard this message and you want to be a part of it, then today is a good day that you give your life to the Lord. Inbox us your name and your phone number, and our membership academy will get back with you as soon as possible. And then don't forget, every day at 1 o'clock we're praying. Um, and I pray that everything is well with you. Pray. The election is too, uh, it's close. <laughs> and uh, we want to do our part and uh, certainly be praying about the election. God bless you and keep you as our prayer. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask that you take this humble presentation, use it to your glory, touch our hearts and our lives. Help us to really understand that you will never leave nor forsake us nor leave us by ourselves, that you will always know and see our affliction and our pain. And not only know it and see it, oh God, but when it comes to the season where it has fulfilled its purpose, you will certainly bring us out of it. And so, God, I pray that you will strengthen us. Don't let us lose our faith in our affliction. Help us to stay focused. Help us to look to the hills, knowing that you are always there, regardless of whether we can feel you or not. We'll be careful to give it praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.